Section 12 of The Economic Consequences of the Peace by John Maynard Keynes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Graham Macmillan. Chapter 7, Part 3. An International Loan. I pass to a second financial proposal. The requirements of Europe are immediate. The prospect of being relieved of oppressive interest payments to England and America over the whole life of the next two generations, and of receiving from Germany some assistance year by year to the costs of restoration, would free the future from excessive anxiety, but it would not meet the ills of the immediate present, the excess of Europe's imports over her exports, the adverse exchange, and the disorder of the currency. It will be very difficult for European production to get started again without a temporary measure of external assistance. I am therefore a supporter of an international loan in some form or other, such as has been advocated in many quarters in France, Germany, and England, and also in the United States. In whatever way the ultimate responsibility for repayment is distributed, the burden of finding the immediate resources must inevitably fall in major part upon the United States. The chief objections to all the varieties of this species of project are, I suppose, the following. The United States is disinclined to entangle herself further, after recent experiences, in the affairs of Europe, and anyhow has for the time being no more capital to spare for export on a large scale. There is no guarantee that Europe will put financial assistance to proper use, or that she will not squander it, and be in just as bad case two or three years hence as she is in now. M. Klotz will use the money to put off the day of taxation a little longer. Italy and Yugoslavia will fight one another on the proceeds. Poland will devote it to fulfilling towards all her neighbors the military role which France has designed for her. The governing classes of Romania will divide up the booty among themselves. In short, America would have postponed her own capital developments and raised her own cost of living in order that Europe might continue for another year or two the practices, the policy, and the men of the past nine months. And as for assistance to Germany, is it reasonable or at all tolerable that the European allies, having stripped Germany of her last vestige of working capital, in opposition to the arguments and appeals of the American financial representatives at Paris, should then turn to the United States for funds to rehabilitate the victim in sufficient measure to allow the spoliation to recommence in a year or two? There is no answer to these objections, as matters are now. If I had influence at the United States Treasury, I would not lend a penny to a single one of the present governments of Europe. They are not to be trusted with resources, which they would devote to the furtherance of policies in repugnance to which, in spite of the President's failure to assert either the might or the ideals of the people of the United States, the Republican and the Democratic parties are probably united. But if, as we must pray they will, the souls of the European peoples turn away this winter from the false idols which have survived the war that created them, and substitute in their hearts for the hatred and the nationalism which now possess them, thoughts and hopes of the happiness and solidarity of the European family, then should natural piety and filial love impel the American people to put on one side all the smaller objections of private advantage and to complete the work that they began in saving Europe from the tyranny of organized force, by saving her from herself. And even if the conversation is not fully accomplished, and some parties only in each of the European countries have espoused a policy of reconciliation, America can still point the way and hold up the hands of the party of peace by having a plan and a condition on which she will give her aid to the work of renewing life. The impulse which, we are told, is now strong in the mind of the United States to be quit of the turmoil, the complication, the violence, the expense, and above all, the unintelligibility of the European problems, is easily understood. No one can feel more intensely than the writer to retort to the folly and impracticability of the European statesman, wrought then in your own malice, and we will go our way. Remote from Europe, from her blasted hopes, her fields of carnage and polluted air, but if America recalls for a moment what Europe has meant to her, and still means to her, what Europe, the mother of art and of knowledge, in spite of everything, still is, and still will be, will she not reject these counsels of indifference and isolation, and interest herself in what may prove decisive issues for the progress and civilization of all mankind? Assuming, then, if only to keep our hopes up, that America will be prepared to contribute to the process of building up the good forces of Europe, and will not, having completed the destruction of an enemy, leave us to our misfortunes. What form should her aid take? I do not propose to enter on details, but the main outlines of all schemes for an international loan are much the same. 
the countries in a position to lend assistance, the neutrals, the United Kingdom, and for the greater portion of the sum required, the United States, must provide foreign purchasing credits for all the belligerent countries of continental Europe, allied and enemy alike. The aggregate sum required might not be so large as is sometimes supposed. Much might be done, perhaps, with a fund of $1 billion in the first instance. This sum, even if a precedent of a different kind had been established by the cancellation of inter-ally war debt, should be lent and should be borrowed with the unequivocal intention of its being repaid in full. With this object in view, the security for the loan should be the best obtainable, and the arrangements for its ultimate repayment as complete as possible. In particular, it should rank, both for payment of interest and discharge of capital, in front of all reparation claims, all inter-ally war debt, all internal war loans, and all other government indebtedness of any other kind. Those borrowing countries who will be entitled to reparation payments should be required to pledge all such receipts to repayment of the new loan. And all the borrowing countries should be required to place their customs duties on a gold basis and to pledge such receipts to its service. Expenditure out of the loan should be subject to general, but not detailed, supervision by the lending countries. If, in addition to this loan for the purchase of food and materials, a guarantee fund were established up to an equal amount, namely $1 billion, of which it would probably prove necessary to find only a part in cash, to which all members of the League of Nations would contribute according to their means, it might be practicable to base upon it a general reorganization of the currency. In this manner, Europe might be equipped with the minimum amount of liquid resources necessary to revive her hopes, to renew her economic organization, and to enable her great intrinsic wealth to function for the benefit of her workers. It is useless at the present time to elaborate such schemes in further detail. A great change is necessary in public opinion before the proposals of this chapter can enter the region of practical politics, and we must await the progress of events as patiently as we can. Part 4. The Relations of Central Europe to Russia I have said very little of Russia in this book. The broad character of the situation there needs no emphasis, and of the details we know almost nothing authentic. But in a discussion as to how the economic situation of Europe can be restored, there are one or two aspects of the Russian question which are vitally important. From the military point of view, an ultimate union of forces between Russia and Germany is greatly feared in some quarters. This would be much more likely to take place in the event of reactionary movements being successful in each of the two countries, whereas an effective unity of purpose between Lenin and the present essentially middle-class government of Germany is unthinkable. On the other hand, the same people who fear such a union are even more afraid of the success of Bolshevism, and yet they have to recognize that the only efficient forces for fighting it are, inside Russia, the reactionaries, and outside Russia, the established forces of order and authority in Germany. Thus the advocates of intervention in Russia, whether direct or indirect, are at perpetual cross-purposes with themselves. They do not know what they want, or rather they want what they cannot help seeing to be incompatibles. This is one of the reasons why their policy is so inconstant and so exceedingly futile. The same conflict of purpose is apparent in the attitude of the Council of the Allies at Paris towards the present government of Germany. A victory of Spartacism in Germany might well be the prelude to revolution everywhere. It would renew the forces of Bolshevism in Russia, and precipitate the dreaded union of Germany and Russia. It would certainly put an end to any expectations which have been built on the financial and economic clauses of the Treaty of Peace. Therefore, Paris does not love Spartacus. But on the other hand, a victory of reaction in Germany would be regarded by everyone as a threat to the security of Europe, and is endangering the fruits of victory and the basis of peace. Besides, a new military power establishing itself in the East, with its spiritual home in Brandenburg, drawing to itself all the military talent and all the military adventurers, all those who regret emperors and hate democracy, in the whole of Eastern and Central and Southeastern Europe, a power which would be geographically inaccessible to the military forces of the Allies, might well found, at least in the anticipations of the timid, a new Napoleonic domination, rising as a phoenix from the ashes of cosmopolitan militarism. So Paris does not love Brandenburg. The argument points, then, to the sustention of those moderate forces of order, which, somewhat to the world's surprise, still manage to maintain themselves on the rock of the German character. 
But the present government of Germany stands for German unity more perhaps than for anything else. The signature of the peace was, above all, the price which some Germans thought it worthwhile to pay for the unity which was all that was left them of 1870. Therefore Paris, with some hopes of disintegration across the Rhine not yet extinguished, can resist no opportunity of insult or indignity, no occasion of lowering the prestige or weakening the influence of a government, with the continued stability of which all the conservative interests of Europe are nevertheless bound up. The same dilemma affects the future of Poland in the role which France has cast for her. She is to be strong, Catholic, militarist, and faithful, the consort, or at least the favorite, of victorious France, prosperous and magnificent between the ashes of Russia and the ruin of Germany. Romania, if only she could be persuaded to keep up appearances a little more, is a part of the same scatterbrained conception. Yet, unless her great neighbors are prosperous and orderly, Poland is an economic impossibility with no industry but Jew-baiting. And when Poland finds that the seductive policy of France is pure rodomontade, and that there is no money in it whatever, no glory either, she will fall as promptly as possible into the arms of somebody else. The calculations of diplomacy lead us, therefore, nowhere. Crazy dreams and childish intrigue in Russia and Poland and thereabouts are the favorite indulgence at present of those Englishmen and Frenchmen who seek excitement in its least innocent form, and believe, or at least behave as if, foreign policy was of the same genre as a cheap melodrama. Let us turn, therefore, to something more solid. The German government has announced, October 30, 1919, its continued adhesion to a policy of non-intervention in the internal affairs of Russia, not only on principle, but because it believes that this policy is also justified from a practical point of view. Let us assume that at last we also adopt the same standpoint, if not on principle, at least from a practical point of view. What are then the fundamental economic factors in the future relations of Central to Eastern Europe? Before the war, Western and Central Europe drew from Russia a substantial part of their imported cereals. Without Russia, the importing countries would have had to go short. Since 1914, the loss of the Russian supplies has been made good, partly by drawing on reserves, partly from the bumper harvest of North America called forth by Mr. Hoover's guaranteed price, but largely by economies of consumption and by privation. After 1920, the need of Russian supplies will be even greater than it was before the war, for the guaranteed price in North America will have been discontinued. The normal increase of population there will, as compared with 1914, have swollen the home demand appreciably, and the soil of Europe will not have yet recovered its former productivity. If trade is not resumed with Russia, wheat in 1920-1921, to unless the seasons are especially bountiful, must be scarce and very dear. The blockade of Russia, lately proclaimed by the Allies, is therefore a foolish and short-sighted proceeding. We are blockading not so much Russia as ourselves. The process of reviving the Russian export trade is bound in any case to be a slow one. The present productivity of the Russian peasant is not believed to be sufficient to yield an exportable surplus on the pre-war scale. The reasons for this are obviously many but amongst them are included the insufficiency of agricultural implements and accessories, and the absence of incentive to production caused by the lack of commodities in the towns which the peasants can purchase in exchange for their produce. Finally, there is a decay of the transport system, which hinders or renders impossible the collection of local surpluses in the big centers of distribution. I see no possible means of repairing this loss of productivity within any reasonable period of time, except through the agency of German enterprise and organization, it is impossible, geographically and for many other reasons, for Englishmen, Frenchmen, or Americans to undertake it. We have neither the incentive nor the means for doing the work on a sufficient scale. Germany, on the other hand, has the experience, the incentive, and to a large extent the materials for furnishing the Russian peasant with the goods of which he has been starved for the past five years, for reorganizing the business of transport and collection, and so bringing into the world's pool for the common advantage the supplies from which we are now so disastrously cut off. It is in our interest to hasten the day when German agents and organizers will be in a position to set and train in every Russian village the impulses of ordinary economic motive. This is a process quite independent of the governing authority in Russia, but we may surely predict with some certainty that, whether or not the form of communism represented by Soviet government proves permanently suited to the Russian temperament, the revival of trade, of the comforts of life, 
and of ordinary economic motive are not likely to promote the extreme forms of those doctrines of violence and tyranny which are the children of war and of despair let us then in our russian policy not only applaud and imitate the policy of non-intervention which the government of germany has announced but desisting from a blockade which is injurious to our own permanent interests as well as illegal let us encourage and assist germany to take up again her place in europe as a creator and organizer of wealth for her eastern and southern neighbors there are many persons in whom such proposals will raise strong prejudices i ask them to follow out in thought the result of yielding to these prejudices if we oppose in detail every means by which germany or russia can recover their material well-being because we feel a national racial or political hatred for their populations or their governments we must be prepared to face the consequences of such feelings even if there is no moral solidarity between the nearly related races of europe there is an economic solidarity which we cannot disregard even now the world markets are one if we do not allow germany to exchange products with russia and so feed herself she must inevitably compete with us for the produce of the new world the more successful we are in snapping economic relations between germany and russia the more we shall depress the level of our own economic standards and increase the gravity of our own domestic problems this is to put the issue on its lowest grounds there are other arguments which the most obtuse cannot ignore against a policy of spreading and encouraging further the economic ruin of great countries i see few signs of sudden or dramatic developments anywhere riots and revolutions there may be but not such at present as to have fundamental significance against political tyranny and injustice revolution is a weapon but what counsels of hope can revolution offer to sufferers from economic privation which does not arise out of the injustices of distribution but is general the only safeguard against revolution in central europe is indeed the fact that even to the minds of men who are desperate revolution offers no prospect of improvement whatever there may therefore be ahead of us a long silent process of semi-starvation and of a gradual steady lowering of the standards of life and comfort the bankruptcy and decay of Europe, if we allow it to proceed, will affect everyone in the long run, but perhaps not in a way that is striking or immediate. This has one fortunate side. We may still have time to reconsider our courses and to view the world with new eyes. For the immediate future, events are taking charge, and the near destiny of Europe is no longer in the hands of any man. The events of the coming year will not be shaped by the deliberate acts of statesmen, but by the hidden currents flowing continually beneath the surface of political history of which no one can predict the outcome in one way only can we influence these hidden currents by setting in motion those forces of instruction and imagination which change opinion the assertion of truth the unveiling of illusion the dissipation of hate the enlargement and instruction of men's hearts and minds must be the means in this autumn of nineteen nineteen in which i write we are at the dead season of our fortunes. The reaction from the exertions, the fears, and the sufferings of the past five years is at its height. Our power of feeling or caring beyond the immediate questions of our own material well-being is temporarily eclipsed. The greatest events outside our own direct experience and the most dreadful anticipations cannot move us. We have been moved already beyond endurance and need rest. Never in the lifetime of men now living as the universal element in the soul of man burnt so dimly. For these reasons, the true voice of the new generation has not yet spoken, and silent opinion is not yet formed. To the formation of the general opinion of the future, I dedicate this book. End of chapter 7 Recording by Graham McMillan, San Diego, California End of The Economic Consequences of the Peace by John Maynard Keynes